We're done. Okay, let's see. Um, project image. Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Yay. Yes. Yes. All right. So we don't have an official moderator for today. That's okay. I'm just going to introduce everyone because I've been doing that a lot. So I'm Brian. You probably know that. I'll introduce myself a little more later. First up, we have Amy. Actually, I'm going to just let you introduce yourself, because you know more about yourself than I do. So, <laughs> have fun! And this is Amy, everyone. Okay. Okay. I'm just making sure, because I'm not a loudspeaker. But, um, hi, uh, my name is Amy DeVos. Uh, you are, will probably know me more as the person who runs the Tumblr blog, Asexuality Resources. Um, it's basically a blog to reach out to the people who aren't as aware of asexuality, so we use graphics to reach out using tags and uh, help answer question, simple questions about asexuality, also making viral images to help spread our reach. Um, I've, this is basically an example of some of the things that I've done. And we're actually working on a uh, collage of asexual faces. If you're interested in that, you can have a talk to me later if you want to be a part of that. And I also organized the local asexual clubs in the KW area, which is uh, just about an hour away from here. So if you're from Toronto, you can still come out. We still have some Toronto people that come to ours. I've also been on Kevin Newcomb Live, and I've been uh, interviewed by the Epoch Times, and I've also helped with designing the promotional materials, like your schedules and all that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to talk about tips on presenting. So, first off, these are kind of topics that you could cover when you're talking about basic one-on-one -on -one sexuality, which is what I'm talking on what you're going to be presenting. Uh, so you could cover the definitions, attraction, romantic, aromantic, libido, sex drive, gray area, attitudes towards sex, so what asexuals feel about having sex and how sex is portrayed in society. Uh, symbols, uh, relationships, just, those are just examples of what you can talk about in your presentations. And also, some of these tips can also go well if you're trying to come out, because some of these tips might be helpful in those areas. So, tip one, this is really optional, really, but presenting is a lot of visual, so you're representing a community. And it's important to be seen well so that people can take what you're saying seriously. So sometimes, if you're a little out there, sometimes people make judgments, which isn't great, but it happens. And if, if you want to, it's, it's up to you. This is really optional, really. But clean hair, those kind of things. So knowing your content. So you're not going to be wanting to having a cue card in front of your face and reading off your points and just kind of being like, make sure you feel comfortable with your knowledge of your sexuality, <laughs> have answers prepared, that kind of thing. Um, and also, it's important to keep eye contact with your audience so you're not stuck looking at the computer or looking at your uh, presentation. So avoid slang and jargon. If you're talking to people who don't know about asexuality, they're not going to know what those terms mean unless you tell them. So things like ace, they don't know that that's short for asexuality and stuff like that. Um, even with internet jargon, if you frequent the forums on even so terms like trolling you're not gonna if you have an audience that's older they're not gonna understand that or that 
if they're not, they don't use the internet, it's not going to come across to them. And sometimes it can be seen as tacky sometimes to some people. And that also goes for cake. So if you're going to make a joke about cake, make sure you're, that your audience knows what the cake joke is about so they can get the joke. So being simple and concise. So you want to make sure you're not not everyone is an intellectual. Some people have a really limited vocabulary. So if you want people to understand what you're telling them, you have to keep it simple. Five minutes, OK, OK. <laughs> um, so analogies also help with keeping things simple, making sure it's easy to understand. And also for PowerPoints, you got to make sure you don't have like a huge wall of text so people can easily pick out the points. So visual aids help too, because not everyone uh, has the same type of learning. Um, I'm going to speed this up for time's sake, but also time setting up. Make sure you have all your technology that works. I know we didn't do that. <laughs> we have excuses, but yeah. <laughs> and speaking clearly, so make sure your audience knows that, uh, make sure you know if your audience can hear you, because obviously they're not going to understand if they can't hear you. And also speaking too fast or too slow. And be relaxed and open. So what I mean by this is you want to help people understand. And if you come off as aggressive and be like, oh, you can't ask that question, that's inappropriate, they might feel a bit guarded and they'll be like, oh, I don't want to ask a question because I don't want to offend them and they don't want to be called out on it. But maybe they are there to learn and want to know and don't want to be offensive, but they don't see it as offensive to them. And it's good to not assume that the intention of your audience is malicious, so they may not be trying to in invalidate you. They just are trying to understand. And also don't feel pressured to answer questions you're not comfortable with. There's always options like uh, saying that you can answer their questions afterwards more privately or you can give them resources to find those answers out for themselves. And that's about it for my part. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Brian. You probably know me by now. I've been around. So, yeah, I have a PowerPoint too. I'm just, you can blame me for the technical difficulties. I don't know if, yeah, yeah, just blame me. I don't know if it was my fault, but yeah. Okay, so I have a PowerPoint for you today, and I actually used a custom font, not expecting to use a laptop other than my own. But I installed it, so we'll see if it works. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Uh -oh. There we go. So, today, as you can see, I will be talking about connecting to an audience. Here's a little presentation summary. So, I'm going to begin by talking about my background, what I've done for visibility and education. I'm going to move on to selecting a medium briefly, I'm going to talk about telling a story, building an audience, and audience interaction. And let us move on. Brian's background. Everything's A-OK. -okay. <laughs> so, in January of 2013, which was a while ago, um, I began a project that is now known as Everything's A-OK. -okay. You might have heard of us. We're on YouTube. Um, this is basically the timeline. So, I can't really see this laptop. Um, September 2013, our first video launched. In October 2013, our videos were featured on the Huffington Post, and that brought a lot of traffic to us. And December, we had an unexpected hiatus because I was really busy, so we didn't post a video for three months. 
and that was my fault. And then in April, we came back and posted the final video, and then we began planning for the future just a few weeks ago. So yes, I will move on from there. If you want to learn more, you can visit my YouTube. Um, I don't know, can you just read the text there? Okay, I'm going to read it out word for word for you. I think the rest is white text, but we'll see. Okay, as of today, Everything's A-OK -okay has brought content to more than 400 subscribers, 17,500 viewers, and 130 countries. And if you think that's impressive, Ivy over here has done better. Um, <laughs> yes, that is true. Okay. Um, so, Everything's A-OK -okay has greatly contributed to asexual awareness and education around the world. And moving on to, what can you do? Selecting a medium. Okay, um, this is all really messy. So, I'm actually going to... I don't even know. Um, I'll just talk, basically. So, I can't read what the first line says, but it says, I chose YouTube because... This is the whole custom font thing. Yeah, um, okay. Um, it is a highly recognized platform compared to the asexuality network. Uh, most viewers are unaware of asexuality compared to Tumblr, for example, where a lot of the users who will be searching that are very knowing of it. The content is easily discovered, unlike sites such as Facebook. I don't know if it's easily discovered, I don't really use Facebook. Um, content length allows for sufficient information, unlike Twitter where you have 160 characters and I don't know how you're going to educate a lot about asexuality in 160 characters. But yeah, so that's why I chose YouTube. But choose what works for you. And then make accounts on every other social network site to promote yourself. <laughs> Alright, so, and if you want to learn more about choosing mediums, Ivy is going to be talking about that as well. Perfect. So, telling a story, creating engaging content. Storytelling remains a highly effective method of communication with your audience. Effective stories can convey journeys, can convey overcoming obstacles, fictional narratives, and inspiration. Sharing your story allows your audience to connect with you, gives credibility to your material, and all people overcome obstacles. Viewers relate well to these stories. Viewers love stories about overcoming obstacles. Viewers may be experiencing those same challenges right now and may be inspired to solve their own. Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Um, fictional stories can convey issues in an entertaining way. People yearn to be inspired and they crave the feeling of knowing that in, in, uh, they crave the feeling of knowing that the impossible is possible. Maybe. Um, yeah. I like when we get to the late gray sides, because you guys can actually read those. Perfect. So, next, audience interaction. Building a community. Interacting with... Yeah, I'm sorry. Next time. Okay. So, follow Amy's tips. Plan ahead. I didn't. Uh, interacting with audience members builds community and entices viewers to return. So, methods of interaction, obviously it's important that you re reply to comments, messages, emails, that you encourage commenting through open-ended questions, whether you ask a question at the end of your video or you are posting on Tumblr and say, re-blog what you think of this. I don't know how Tumblr works either, honestly. Um, <laughs> moving on, building an audience. Uh, gathering viewers outside of Avon. Oh, I forgot to finish my slideshow. So, <laughs> Prepare ahead. I was really busy. I, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I'm just going to speak about what I know about this. I shouldn't have closed this laptop, so now we can't log back in, but maybe. But we'll see. Um, no this is really a mess. Okay, so obviously Avon's going to give you your basic first 30 or so subscribers, and that's what happened with Everything's A-OK. -okay. And that's great. It gives you a good basis, but the issue is everyone who's coming from Avon kind of already knows what asexuality is. So, it's, you're not really educating the masses, per se. So, it is very important if you are trying to get your, or get your content out there that you have social media sites on all other sites, such as Tumblr, Twitter, that kind of thing. I do have those sites, I just don't use them that much, but I should. And you should too, if you do that. Um, 
A lot of views from Everything's A-OK -Okay have come from postings to Reddit and Tumblr, oddly enough, and even though we don't use Tumblr really. And as such, just using external sites really helps build your audience. If you can be lucky enough to get a major news group such as the Huffington Post to just randomly post about your content, that works really well too, <laughs> and that will direct thousands of views to your channel, so I recommend it. I don't know how you get that hook up, but I did somehow. And yeah, so basically, that's building your audience, and yeah, I'm going to welcome up Ivy, who is also going to give a presentation. Hopefully this laptop allows us to use it again, because I closed it. And I was... It's okay, I can do it without. I think, I think, fine, maybe. I didn't even we're fine, we're fine, okay. I didn't even uh, transfer it on there, so. Pretty sure? Yeah. Okay. And then we will be having a question and answer session afterwards. So, if you have any questions and you're confused by all the content that's a little messy, there you go. Please welcome Ivy. So, I'll just do this without PowerPoint. And can you, you know what? There's a water bottle right in my face. I think this is my water bottle that I left here, actually. Um, so I have no visuals, but uh, I'm just going to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we'll deal with it. If you won't, you will walk out, and I'll deal with that. Um, so I'm Ivy. That's what my friends call me. It's a nickname, uh, shortened form of my uh, online handle, which is Swank Ivy. Some of you may know me from YouTube um, and Tumblr, where I'm Swank Ivy. Um, the name that I write professionally under is Julie Sonder Decker. That is on my book, which some of you saw out in the hallway. Uh, it comes out September 2nd. So. Um, yeah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so nice. My heart is melting every time somebody gets so excited about my book. So, thank you. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the various kinds of. Um, presentations, media, writings, content that I have created over the years. I got my start writing a personal essay. This was just on my own web space where I rant about things like my roommate bothering me and running out of toilet paper and oh yes, these are 10 things people always say to me when I say I'm not interested in sex. So, you know, I just, I didn't have any kind of community aspirations, I didn't have any purpose in mind for this except to get it off my chest. At the time that I wrote this essay, uh, it was pre-AVEN, pre-asexuality, community, anything, and I called myself non-sexual, that was the only word I had for it. This was in 1998, I think, was when I posted it first. Um, so it was just 10 things that uh, I found annoying. So uh, what this led to was a, was a occasional media attention and interaction from uh, people who were finding themselves in my story. And so, even though I didn't have any intention with writing this, what this led to was um, one form of interaction that I learned about. So writing a personal essay on your own web space or in a small space, uh, the advantages to this are that it's, you have complete con control of your content and you can make it whatever you want. And it's also very personal and easy to connect to. So you will get interaction from individuals, uh, but that is also leading into the disadvantages, which is that it is only individual connection. This is not a broader community way to get a message out generally, uh, unless your post happens to go viral or something. So there's no mainstream legitimacy, so to speak. Uh, for writing a personal essay on your own space. Um, but what this led to for me was mainstream media attention. I got several interview requests from that, and um, over the years I have been interviewed in Salon, in Huffington Post, um, I was in Marie Claire, uh, the UK magazine Best, uh, the Daily Mail. So, um, Yes, I will talk about that in a minute. Um, I have rarely been pleased with how I was presented, how I was uh, set up in these articles. Very, very rarely. But uh, it was mainstream attention. So even though you can't, as Brian was saying, even though you can't arrange that really without someone proposing to you from one of these news agencies, 
um, it, it's the advantage of it is, of course, is huge exposure for your issue. The disadvantage is, again, you're you're going to get attention that from uh, from uh, this magazine that's going to write you know, however they want to. And uh, for a recent uh, article, they grabbed a picture off of my website or off of my Facebook, sorry, of me in my bathing suit for the article. They didn't even ask me for a headshot. They just figured this is going to get clicks. She's in her bathing suit nine years ago, so <laughs> that's that's how they decided to portray me. Um, I've been in another. This was the Daily Mail. I was uh, referred to as a bisexual psychologist named Julia. So go figure that out. I don't know. So that is a major disadvantage to being in mainstream media is they will probably get it wrong and you won't be able to do anything about it. And on top of that, when mainstream media attacks this issue, it is almost always very, very basic coverage. It is very rarely nuanced at all. So it's, hey, these people exist. Isn't that weird? Okay, now what's going on in soap operas? Um, so uh, anyway. The next thing that I tried in order to reach out to people in the asexual community, because I was inspired by how much uh, discourse this was creating, was I decided to start making YouTube videos. So um, as, uh, as Brian was saying, there are, there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages to that medium. Um, I, make, I make two uh, channel, well I have one channel which is Swank Ivy, and I, I made uh, two web series on there, one was just a video version of my top ten list and the other was letters to an asexual where I read my hate mail and uh, <laughs> usually sometimes it's nice letters rarely um, so the advantage is to being on YouTube is again it's very personal it's very accessible and the visual medium is um, it's it, it reaches a different per a different type of people and you can also subtitle your videos on YouTube, which is something that I do to make them more accessible to everyone. And um, so, of course, the disadvantages is the vile comments. And um, YouTube is famous for vile comments and personal attacks and also a loss of anonymity because you're putting your face there. You can't hide behind your text anymore. So, um, moving on, um, articles. I have written some short articles. And um, they were accepted for publication in various magazines. I've written for Good Vibrations. I have one coming up in the Toast, which is pretty great. Um, and uh, the advantages to that is that it makes the topics kind of seem more legitimate if somebody's running, somebody else besides you is running a story on it. So um, then also you can go into detail on nuances that aren't covered before. My piece that's going to be in the Toast is on the intersection of femininity and asexuality, being a, being a, a female person in in, in, a, in such a sexual world. So um, you know, I've also written about sexual fluidity and how it intersects with asexuality. These are topics that you're not going to see mainstream media covering. Um, so the disadvantage to writing articles and getting them published is you don't have any engagement with your readers really, unless there are comments on the article. With not all articles um, support. And you usually can't amend your content once it's published. You can't get it deleted. You can't do anything about it once it's out there. So um, also uh, blogging is the next thing that I try to do Tumblr. Uh, my blog is Everyday Ignorance. And uh, I share a mixture of personal um, content and uh, bouncing off of other people's content. So the advantages to that are very similar to writing the, the personal essays, like I did in the 90s. The engagement with your followers is easy, um, the content is more personal, and it sounds kind of strange, but it is less subject to scrutiny. Um, fewer people are going to nail you to the wall if you get something wrong. Um, and also it allows your other blog authors to, um, to piggyback on what you're saying. And especially on Tumblr, you get these uh, reblogs and things like that, so we can have actually a discussion. And the disadvantage is anyone can blog, so anyone can blog. And, <laughs> and that's, I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing that anybody can say anything, but the, the stuff that people tend to be saying on blogs is not going to be, um, it's, it's not going to be respected as authoritative, um, which is not necessarily 
a bad thing, but you think about that when you decide how you're going to put your message out there. Um, and lastly, of course, um, <laughs> my book, uh, writing books on the subject. Um, so this is this is my upcoming book. The uh, the publisher is Carol Books. It's an imprint of uh, Skyhorse Publishing. It'll be out September second. And um, of course, the major major advantage to writing a book on a topic like this is that it greatly increases the perceived legitimacy of the topic, especially for the older generation who sometimes thinks if you have to go on the internet to get this content, it cannot be legitimate. So uh, I can't even count how many times I've seen a, uh, a story of a young person saying, I came out to my family, they went to the bookstore, there's no books on this, so they assumed it isn't real. So uh, I've written the book so that people will find it there. Um, of course, the disadvantage is that um, publishing, mainstream publishing is not accessible to very many people. They're very obsessed with platform in nonfiction publishing. But the good news is you can also write uh, a fiction book and try to get that published through small presses, large presses, and self-publishing, anything. I'm actually going to try that next. I've got a book planned with an asexual main character. So uh, we'll see where that gets, but uh, getting published is very difficult. It really was a big pain in the butt, I'm telling you. So, but um, finally, the conclusion here is that uh, the medium that you choose for message, what you should be considering is uh, the, the type and the level of interaction that you want. You should be consi considering the perceived legitimacy of how you want your stuff to be perceived by the masses and the control of the material that you desire. That's it. Thank you, Ivy. So we're going to move into kind of panel forum so that you can ask questions and we can discuss. I think it would probably be best if we all brought a chair up. I think we have chairs here. And there's not very many of us, so we probably won't use the mic. If you can't hear us, feel free to move up further. And that would be excellent. Chairs. Perfect. Why 
asexuality is very largely a white, uh, very largely white people are in the face of asexuality. The reason is asexuality is a very Western concept, so it's mostly seen within Canada, the States, uh, Western Europe, and in those populations there aren't, uh, it's a very minority of people is, are people of color, So whereas the majority of people are white. So just because of that, the majority of asexuals who are identifying as asexual are white. Now, I do agree that we should be looking at intersectionality and how being a person of color relates to asexuality and all of this, but I think just because there are so many white people, that's, white people are probably going to dominate the media for a while, and things will shift as there's more education and visibility and all that. Um, and I would like to say that I, I have um, a section in the book, my upcoming book, about asexual people of color, and of course as a white activist I don't feel that I should be the mouthpiece for what they said, what, they, what their particular experiences are, so I asked them what would you like this section to be about? And a lot of them have said, um, more, more often it's uh, uh, black Americans, black people in the, in the West, and uh, Latino, Latina, Latina, gender neutral. Um, the, um, you see a lot of over-sexualization of those populations, and their sexuality, when they come out as asexual, often interpreted as a reaction to that rather than an intrinsic expression of who they are. So it's, un it's unfortunately, there's a loss of safety that some of them have that m more white people don't have as much of a possibility of a loss of safety when they come out because they alienate themselves from their communities. And um, in general, when you're already a um, when you're already part of a population that is marginalized for a racial issue, then being another kind of population that is also marginalized is a double whammy and it is more risky, it is more uncomfortable. And that's what a lot of them said to me. And also there are groups of people like um, South, South Asian populations and sometimes um, Eastern Asian populations are, they're desexualized and are, they're assumed to all be asexual by Western people. So this misunderstanding of, uh, of everything about them applying to their ethnicity in the context of sexuality makes it more complicated to be asexual and to be a voice for it is, uh, it's more, there are too many, there are lots of intersectional issues and fewer people willing to risk it, and also inside of the community. We are not necessarily as welcoming. Um, and yes, we as white activists need to work on that, absolutely. So, um, yeah. uh, anyone else? Questions? Yeah. Sorry, I rambled so much there. <laughs> Yeah, it's good because they haven't thought of a question yet. So, <laughs> this panel cannot continue until you ask a question. If, so, anybody has a que if anybody has a question about like any of our content that we've created or anything, you can ask that too. Yeah. Um, I have a second question about um, how do you walk the line? Like, I know um, one of you mentioned you know, not answer questions that you feel are too personal, but as you face an issue, how do you walk the line between what is a appropriate to ask in an interview or in like a, a conversation and what you feel needs to be expressed for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess. Um, so I personally haven't done any live interviews, although they are in the climate at the moment. Um, the, as far as uncomfortable questions go, if the interview is pre-recorded, that's excellent because you can say, well, I want this to be in there and then they can cut it out. If it's live, however, it's often an option to speak just generally, not personally to yourself, but to asexuality in general. In general, So say the interview asks you, well, do you masturbate? And you are uncomfortable with disclosing that. You can say, well, portions of the asexual population do, some don't, 
and it depends on many factors such as libido, sex drive, that kind of thing. So there are ways to walk around those questions without answering them directly. Did either of you want to comment on that? You pretty much said what I would have said. Great. Mm -hmm. right. Anyone else? I just want to add to that, for example, kind of advice anybody doing an interview. Um, so it's it good idea to make a list of, sort of the questions that you really thought might come up. Like, question, I mean, that that's actually almost the worst question you can get to be masturbated because it really puts you on the spot and you can't, I mean, it's very difficult to give an answer. So that's a pretty good way, but um, yeah, so I would uh, uh, advise you to kind of think about the worst thing that can come up and work, work out what you're going to say to that, but then apart from that, you know, just be yourself. And, Jay got asked, do you have sex with yourself? Um, yeah. Somebody asked him that. Yeah. Um, you had a question. Yeah. Um, is there anything, we have sort of a standard 101 presentation that we tend to give, are there on a small scale or a large scale? Are there anything that you think we should be sort of take it, I will take it. Um, okay, so with the, the reason I believe, the reason we have that whole asexuality 101 thing set up is because asexuality is so unheard of to so many people that even the concepts of not experiencing sexual attraction and experiencing romantic attraction in comparison to that are very, very new to some people and very difficult to understand. So as soon as you start bringing in all these other offshoots, all these other topics, it becomes a lot more difficult for whoever's listening to you to get the basics. I personally believe it's more important that whoever's learning about it at first gets the basics down rather than gets some other topic that may not be discussed very often, but won't overall contribute to their knowledge of asexuality as much as the basics. I think as our social media and as we as a society grow towards understanding asexuality more, we can start looking at those topics more, but for the time being, I think there is a reason that we have the asexuality 101, and I think that it is a good thing that we have. But uh, as we were actually talking a little bit about it in the aromantic uh, session, and someone brought up a really good point, was it, for people who don't understand it, it's important to go slowly, so be repetitive, and just small doses at a time, and then once they're comfortable with that, then you can start, uh, they, they'll start asking questions, and you, like, to more elaborate discussions, and you can give them those answers, again, slowly. Um, and I would like to say, um, and by the way, great dress. Um, <laughs> I really like that, eight colors. Um, yeah, um, I made a video a while back called Asexuality and Overview. And somebody commented, oh, so, okay, heterosexuality is attraction to the opposite sex. And I don't use opposite, I like to say, you know, the different, gender. but they said opposite. And then they said, and homosexuality is to the same. So, but asexuality is, watch this 15 minute video, run away. So he was suggesting it's too complicated and that we're ridiculous for expecting them to understand all of these things in my own review. But the first sentence was, most people define asexuality as a lack of sexual attraction. And I even say, that's it. So that was a disingenuous way to frame what I was presenting there. But um, yes, the, the I think that if you, if say being asexual was the standard and not being asexual was not standard, how would they want to warn that? Like it would be so complicated to explain everything. So we're not any more complicated than they are. It's just that they have shorthand and we don't have it yet. So now that we know what our shorthand is, I think we can use those terms, make them clear what they are and try to conceive of how we would tell somebody about asexuality. Um, like if somebody was not asexual, how, what would be their points? You know, try to simplify it. 
that way. And um, I think it's, I don't really know quite how to answer your question because it seemed like you were asking for specifics on what should we cover as one-on-one -on -one material. Um, and I think what we just probably ought to do is listen to the questions that we get and start incorporating those into materials if it's almost always we get this question right after we post it. So that's, that's kind of, I would let the, uh, the people who want to know guide our progress on that. That would be my advice. Anyone else? Yes. Um, is there any medium that you feel is underutilized that could have potential for education and disability or etc.? I don't know who's doing The problem with Twitter is that it's so short form and it's really hard to get something trending and it's just harder to reach more people using that platform. So that's probably the one that's very underwhelming in terms of covering asexuality. Are there any that you know of that you were wondering if we don't use or just throwing that out? Um, I, I didn't have anything in mind. Okay. Like I said YouTube and Tumblr, and you we were talking right. about webcomics earlier, and I know yeah. I see a lot of webcomics. Web comics, Something yes. that I haven't seen personally is postings to Instagram. Granted, I don't use Instagram, so <laughs> I don't know. But from what I can tell, I don't use a lot of social media. I'm really bad at it. I'm trying because I know it's important. Um, Instagram is a very, very popular social network. I believe it has several million users, regular users, and I don't think anyone's taking use of that. Obviously, it's difficult to spread a lot of asexual awareness with an image and a short text caption, but I think even just putting the visibility out there, that could be a medium that hasn't been explored yet. You're doing that. Yeah, basically. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Okay, well, so we are. Instagram, oh. but you're creating these. Uh, okay, so if someone wants to put those on Instagram, I don't know if that's how it works. But yeah, Tumblr's, Tumblr's the art of Tumblr I've found is that visuals spread farther and are more interesting to people than a wall of text or like an essay or things like that because yeah. it takes a long time and effort to put into reading an essay about asexuality when they can just see an image and it's right to the point. Stuff gets reblogged at the tab long posts all the time. Too long to do it for you. Know? <laughs> 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 supernatural. <laughs> uh, you know what though? Twitter has taught me to be more concise. <laughs> Not very well, but you know. I still am a bit rambling, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I've had to I've had to shorten just about every piece of writing I've ever had accepted for publication. With the exception of the toast, they asked me to make it longer. <laughs> I almost fainted. Well, for some people, that's yeah. what they prefer. They want yeah. like deep conversation. And yeah. That there's a market for it. It's yeah. just yeah. significantly taller than others. <laughs> yeah. well, that enabled me, though, to more personal details because I thought I was done on that subject. It was intersection of uh, asexuality and femininity and what my experiences have been. And I was able to make it more personal. I don't know when that's going to run. They told me end of June and or early July, so it should be hitting any time now. So it should be tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to that. That's a new. I don't know if you've heard of the toast. It's the to the hyphen toast dot net, um, and they are they're like an up and coming, really cool blog. I read a really cool story there on the, you know, somebody who was the partner of a transgender person. Experience, very cool personal stories, and they also punish. Punish. They also publish <laughs> funny, funny stuff, and like what I just said, and uh, and uh, factual things too. It's pretty great. But I like that site. I don't work for them. <laughs> what else? Because 
you're not going to change their mind. What I've learned from a lot of people, most people are very, very persistent about their cause. They really want their cause to succeed, but they won't listen to any other argument. For, for many people, you, as logical as you may be, as many facts as you may present, they're going to stay stuck in their ways. So engaging skills, it's a waste of your time. I mean, you're wasting their time, so that's nice. But <laughs> um, they're just going to continue trolling. So I personally say ignore the trolls. If you want to delete them, that's fun. But um, yeah, I, I say no. If you have their opinion, that's cool. But yeah, don't do it. It's so much emotional stuff. You don't want to just ignore it. <laughs> well, trolls do have one use. Um, and I was somebody who's really just that hateful, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Because what the trolls are saying is usually a more aggressive, more viable version of what some people are thinking, or are nicer about, or don't say. So what I do is if I showcase the worst example of somebody saying this, and give reasonable arguments about why they're a piece of crap, then people start to understand why that is really offensive to say, because they've seen it phrased in such an awful way, and I've, I can boil that down to what the core of their objection is. But yes, there is a point where you need to protect yourself if it's too exhausting, and there is a point where you don't want to let those people have a voice for dominating your material in a commenting or trolling. Quite a few large scale trolling attacks on my material, and it's no big thing. I don't have any of this. There's a little section for you and what you do on the internet and your personal life. How has one affected you? And how has like, the stuff on the internet has affected your personal life? And how has your personal life like, made you the material or stuff that I've got? Thank you. 
this is not the last session for the day. There will be one more in this room after uh, the five minutes for everybody to get in. Uh, but for all of you who are leaving now, and some of you are, uh, we'll be collecting donations down at the main registration area. And these are spread, uh, donations are going to go towards future visibility and efforts, uh, including fundraising for super costs or pamphlets, future pride parades, or conferences like this. So if you're interested in all in donating, those boxes will be downstairs in the registration uh, area, but it's you know, you can donate if you want. Or if you don't want, that's cool. Your attendance is more than welcome. And so, yeah, it's our next.